Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's podcast broadcast of This Week in Science. We are going to be podcast broadcasting, and this is the live-ish thing. It's live right now as we're doing it. And if you're here with us right now, right now, then you're with us live. But um, maybe you're watching it later and it's not live, but it's still where it would be streaming. Um, Anyway, the stream, we take it, we edit it for the podcast. Stuff gets taken out if it should be taken out. And so the final product is not necessarily what you will be seeing in this live podcast broadcast, right? But if you're if you're uh, listening to this later, you didn't hear any of this because all of this was already removed. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Okay, everybody. You're in the studio with us right now. This is how it's true. This is, this is how it goes. Let us begin to make the science sandwich. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Starting in three, two. This is twist this week in science episode number 919 recorded on wednesday march 29th 2023 how to do the science dance hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we will fill your heads with hotness stress and death but first disclaimer 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 Imagine for a moment a world without disease, a world without death, a world in which people are free to live their lives without cancer, diabetes, dementia, heart attacks, or lung disease, a world without extreme cases of depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, or neurodevelopmental disorders, a world where children meet their great-great-great-grandparents, and the dog you grew up with is the same dog your children one day play with. For one thing, a future like this will require a much different approach to society. Sustainability will have a far greater importance in managing the resources of an undying world. Population pressures will require a rethinking of every aspect of our economies, our source and use of energy, our definitions of work and compensation, from food we eat to the waste we produce, Everything will need to be rethought, reimagined, and re-engineered. This modern age of miracle medical science, this undying world, is not the age we are living in, but it is the age we are now building. And the solutions that will be required are the solutions we have needed for some time. Solutions provided here each week on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are so glad you have joined us once again in the science studio to discuss all the sciencey things we like to we like to discuss we have a great show for you up ahead we have science many Sciencey things. Like I said, there's hotness. I've got some hotness. I've also got some stress for lizards, some cockleburs for your life, and signal strength and multiple sclerosis. Justin, what do you have? I also brought some hotness. Oh, In fact, we, uh, we're going to answer the question it. 2021. How hot was it? <laughs> Also, so hot. <laughs> also, so hot. The cows were were given powdered milk. No. So, uh, and then I'm going to get into ancient genomic immunity. 
Penn State researchers replacing humans with robots, and the death of the scientific mega journal. Oh no. Yeah. Oh well, or maybe oh or, yeah. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's a very the, the subject is very nuanced and has many sides. Well, I can't wait to get to that. Blair, what is in the animal corner? <laughs> um, I that have laugh. skeptical <laughs> fish, and I also have uh, some transparent uh, human skin cells from squids. You do? Can you show us? I wow. wish, I but then you wouldn't be able to see me, would you? Oh, okay. So oh, here. Right. Hold on, let me turn it on. <laughs> oh, wow. Those really work. There you go. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Okay, everybody, let's uh, dig into the science. But before we begin, I would, uh, well, I have to tell you, I'd love to tell you that you can find us all places podcasts are found because this show is a podcast. We stream weekly Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time ish. And this is on YouTube, Twitch and Facebook. We are Twist Science on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and Mastodon. And if all of this is just a lot to remember then go to our website, twist.org, where you can find show notes and all sorts of other fun things. All right. Let us begin the show. Far away. Far, far away from our wonderful planet. There exists a system of seven other planets around an a red dwarf M-class star. These planets are close to their star. So they get a lot more heat than our Earth gets from our own star. But how nice would it be to take those planets' temperatures? Is it TRAPPIST? Is that the one? Yes. So it I'm is? talking okay. about the TRAPPIST-1 system. And this system, like I said, it has about... Uh, and we have found seven planets around it. So exoplanets far away from us we have been looking at. And we've, we've checked them out with Hubble. We've checked them out with, uh, with other space telescopes, with other, with other things, Spitzer Space Telescope, trying to figure out what's going on over there, whether there are atmospheres on these planets, what kind of orbital system they have, whether they're rocky, whether they're gaseous. We've been trying to figure all this stuff out. It's been kind of hazy. Haven't really been able to determine what's going on. And so we have finally put the focus of the mirror instrument or the MIRI instrument from the JWIST looking at this TRAPPIST-1 system at a specific planet called TRAPPIST-1b. It's like the second planet in that little system, right? If it's A, B, C, D, all of the planets get little letters. It's a very, very close to its star. But how do you get a temperature of something that is so close to something that's already really hot? Right? How do you do this? So the M dwarf star, it has 2,566 2, Kelvins. It's very slightly larger than our sun, but not quite as hot because it's it's um, old. Well, it's ultra cool. Now, what we know from finding these exoplanets is that we find the exoplanets based on how they transit their stars or how uh, sometimes they move behind their stars, right? So they're going around the stars at a particular rate. And when they move in front, the light of the star dims. And when they move behind, well, it doesn't really change, right? Because it's going behind. But because of this, they could determine that, all right, we've got this rocky planet. I figure it's rocky because of the mass and the, the way things are moving around and the signals that we've gotten so far. So it's close there. We think it is locked, orbitally locked to the, to the star so that one side is always facing it's always hmm. like the like the, the moon is to the earth mm -hmm. right it's always it's always mm -hmm. facing us and so it's got like a termination line there's a hot awesome. side and there's a cold side now if it has an atmosphere that atmosphere would distribute the heat from the mm -hmm. hot side around the planet to the cool side and you would expect one particular kind of 
temperature. You would expect a particular amount, number of kelv kelvins, degrees centigrade, degrees Fahrenheit, whatever. Um, if there's no atmosphere, you would expect that there's no real distribution of that heat easily other than through just the rock of the planet. And so there are two different models for what we expect and what we thought would be there. And when the JWIST dis was focused, the MIRI instrument was able to look at the infrared uh, radiation from the star and the very slight 0.01% change in the, in, the, in the radiation from the star as this rocky planet passed behind the star, they were able to actually determine the, uh, the temperature, the, the black body radiation, based on black body radiation of this rocky planet, um, based, basically what was subtracted from what was there when it was just facing the star. And so everything lines up with the models that there's absolutely no atmosphere on this particular rocky planet. It's orbitally tidally locked to its, to its star. And um, it, it almost exactly what we measured matches up with our modeling of a dark surface rocky planet with ha which has no atmosphere and no re redistribution of heat. So we didn't think we could go live there anyway, but it seems a lot less likely. <laughs> <laughs> that this this planet, which is sitting at about 450 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it, it it seems unlikely as a place for it's any a little warm any life. Right, it's a little bit warm. Hmm. But now this gives us a new way we can use JWIST to look at other exoplanets to be right. able to discover different systems to be able to determine how our models actually fit to measure data and this and this is very exciting also because our measured data does fit our model which is yeah very, very yeah cool. very closely that's yeah. that's pretty uh it's pretty awesome yeah yeah so anyway good job another another job well done for the jwist aren't we glad we launched that thing finally and that it's working yeah i have to say I it hasn't broken yet doing not, great not yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that that's the that's the crucial point? Is uh, how long will it last before eventually uh, some bit of debris, a uh, little tiny, yeah, something runs yeah. into it and, and knocks it out? But I mean, Hubble maintained, yeah. but you know, they just they don't make stuff like they used to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't make things like they I, used to. I'm oh. joking. In this case, yeah. NASA better make things NASA, like they used NASA to. NASA makes things better than they than we used to. That's the that's the cool thing about it. they over engineer to the point that the those, those little rovers that were supposed to only last a few months mm -hmm. lasted for years mm -hmm. and years on Mars. And it's a lot of them are still there. Their still things going. are still robots singing still happy going. birthday to themselves annually. <laughs> Just doing a great job. A party that maybe someday we will be invited to. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to have to deal with all the hotness that's going on here on our own planet. What's up, Justin, with our hotness? Yeah, the summer of 2021, especially in the Pacific Northwest of the United States and Canada. Uh, was was hot. It was a hot one. How hot was it? Yeah. It was so hot that trees were seen luring dogs with treats. <laughs> Wait, what? Work, work that one out. <laughs> it was it was so hot the local bakery only served toast. It was so how hot was it? It was so hot uh, that temperature records were set by tens of degrees in many places. Wildfires broke out and at least 1,400 people died. Boy, that, that wasn't, that wait, wasn't, a, that wasn't, that wasn't that, funny. No. Uh, yeah, new assessment suggests that by the year 2050, Ooh. we will be experiencing heat waves just like 2021 about every other year. Wow. Tree rings. There was a tree ring study to incorporate into this. The tree rings of the region show that the event is the worst, hottest summer 
in at least the past 1,000 years. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was hot, right? Yeah. It was a very it hot was, one for a lot of people. It was hot I'm trying to remember, weren't we stuck heat. inside still at that point? So I, fires. <laughs> nobody and, noticed. I don't, I don't nobody remember. <laughs> I, was, I was indoors, I believe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what's sort of interesting about this study, too, is that... Uh, so they say there is, there is another, uh, another hot period that took place uh, around the year 950. But that was much cooler than this current hot streak. The new study shows that the last 40 years, driven by uh, human-influenced warming, has been the hottest period in the last thousand years, and that 2021 was the hottest summer of the hottest summers in that entire span of time. Also, it's sort of interesting, though, is that they, they had to do all of their tree rings from elevation, from, from uh, sort of mountain elevations. They, they, because turns out the tree record for the low-lying areas doesn't go back that far on account of wildfires and people cutting down all the trees to put houses and stuff. So they had to go up. So they, they were doing comparatives of, of what would have been a cooler climate, and we still were one and a half degrees seasonally higher uh, than than the average at the at the cooler elevations. So it's uh, yeah, every uh, by twenty twenty uh, twenty fifty, I guess. Which that's like a long way away, isn't it? Twenty fifty. No. That sounds like the distant <laughs> future. No, but no. Blair, you're not paying attention to years and numbers like that. You're so young. <laughs> 2050. Every other year is yeah. going to be uh, uh, like that. But but now that's also the also the thing though is that that's their their original prediction from an earlier paper was it would be once every ten years we would have a summer like that, and uh, now it's <laughs> every other year. Uh, by the time we get there, yeah, we, it may be, oh, we'll never have a cool summer like 2021 again. Well, I remember the old days when, oh, goodness. But, yeah, it's just going to keep getting hotter. Uh, apparently, it has, they think it has something to do with uh, uh, an effect that they're calling anthropomorphic climate change. Yes. Something we yes. might want to look into on this, uh, this here show. Yeah, but I'm wondering also how these cycles all tie together as, you know, we, we just ended a three-year El Nino, La Nina cycle, and we, we finally, the meteorologists have said that we've switched to, uh, you know, from what was giving us really hot summers and wet winters for the last three years mm -hmm. uh, into the into a different kind of uh of weather phase. And so there's the El Nino La Nina cycle, but then there's also the, the decadal Pacific oscillation. And then we also have, um, you know, globally other cycles that occur through the Atlantic ocean and other, you know, other parts of the world. Yeah. And I'm wondering how the anthropomorphic climate change that's occurring, the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, how it is shifting all of these different cycles and what those are, you know, how those different influences are coming together. Yeah. So, is, yeah. so there are already, we've already been noticing, uh, what do you call it, uh, jet stream changes? Changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is showing up quite a bit in the, uh, the airline industry because turbulence... Oh, yeah tends to take place at uh, areas of where the where there's big changes in jet the airstream the jet stream where uh, these fast moving narrow bands of air are coming one way and then they kind of pressure drops so this is where the high turbulent area is and airlines usually have traditionally plotted courses around them but those are moving <laughs> and so airlines are having to find maybe different routes and so what that implies is that weather is also going to be different. Like, 
all these like, oh, we have the what do you call it, the Pacific Coast undulating whatever thing it was you were mentioning in there, Kiki. The decadal then, oscillations, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we have a name for this because it reoccurs. Yeah. And it's regularly somewhat and, definable. Yeah. yeah. Right? We if that changes, then our poor weather people predicting <laughs> the weather will be like, um, I don't know. Back to you, Chuck. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a there's a lot. And, and especially if this study, it is more West Coast focused because of where they took all the tree rings and what yes. they've seen there. And so that, of course, is going to have been influenced a lot more by, you know, like you said, you know, use the, the Pacific Ocean by the El Nino, La Nina, also mm. these other things. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to go hide in the shade. I'm going to just go hide in the shade for the summer. Hang out like a cat. Isn't that what cats do, Blair? Hang out? Uh, some cats, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a, a very strange study about pumas, uh, mountain lions, cougars, whatever you want to call them. I guess this is a study cougar. published in Landscape <laughs> Ecology, and uh, it's all based on this uh, very specific way that pumas cougars mountain lions hunt the they're they're kind of they will chase prey but a lot of their behavior has to do with waiting for something to happen by and then they will chase it they're not doing mm. a lot of stalking long term um, they're not doing a lot of tracking and so is this the ambush hunting it's it's not, I wouldn't exactly call them ambush predators because That's they're not just hunting. jumping out as something comes by like an alligator. They're, okay. but, but it's, it's kind of in between the two, okay. right? Because if some, like, yeah. if that's why you have to watch out if you're, if you're um, a runner that goes through mountain lion areas and you like to run through parks is because yeah. if you run right by a waiting mountain lion, their instinct is to chase that thing that ran right by its face, basically, right? Mm. But they're not going to do long-term tracking or anything like that. So when they do that, um, when other animals, when other carnivores hunt, they will dismember their kills. They'll bring specific yeah. pieces back. But on top of this kind of specific way that they hunt, pumas also maintain intact carrion, so the intact kills. And they will then kind of pull that off into the shade or into the bushes, and so uh, what happens is, I think even we reported on the show at one point, um, they get spooked and they will leave an entire kill and they won't come back for it. And so with humans, that causes problems. But otherwise, has things normally work in the food web, wait, this actually wait. helps feed wait. other animals oh. because of kleptoparasitism. So basically they get spooked, they leave an entire carrion, um, and then other animals will come and eat that dead animal that has been left whole in that space. And so the pumas contribute a disproportionate amount of food to other wildlife. So they are feeding other animals. So this creates a very interesting dynamic in their biome. They only consume about a third of what they catch on average, and the rest supports scavengers, but the other thing huh. is that it supports plants. So, um, yeah. So in this study, they yeah. looked over a nine-year lifespan. Pumas were estimated to have created approximately 482 temporary hotspots of nutrient soil in this one area. And so what they, what they posit, which I feel like is kind of a leap if I am being honest, is that they are essentially gardening. So like, so they they bring their carrion. <laughs> gardening the carrion with blood. Yes, it, it is always in kind of a very dense area that, that, that puts nutrients in the soil. That means the plants grow very well. And then deer come and eat those plants. That allows them to catch their food. So it's, is it on purpose? Or is it just a function of how they work and it makes them work less hard to get their food. What happened first? Was it a happy accident? Are they doing it intentionally? I feel like that's a stretch, but that is something. Yeah, that I mean, they would have suggests. to, they would have to return to that same, like they would have to show that this, uh, they've done this kill in this spot. 
enough times. I don't know. Eh. And they do. It just seems like they're describing the cycle partially... of life there. But Exactly. Yes. And yeah. the amount of time it takes between the deadfall to and the, the new, the, yeah. the, like, yeah. the new kill. Yeah. time involved. Yeah. I mean, that's serious <laughs> long-term planning yeah. for yeah. a meal. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> not that it's not possible. Yeah, Second, but it is not it's impossible. an interesting <laughs> idea. And it's also, I think, a, a good um, highlight of why top predators are important in ecosystems. It's beyond them thinning out the herd and controlling populations. Sometimes they're feeding other mm -hmm. animals, and a lot of the time they are adding nutrients to soil. And so they are changing the landscape based on where they kill things and where they eat things. So it's a good reminder about kind of this cascading impact of predators in a space. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they'd have to do a whole lot of work to go to the actual like intent to, to prove the yes. intent side of it. But, but in a sense, metaphorically, you know, yeah, the, <laughs> metaphorically, metaphorically, the, they are gardening. They're sure. Gardening. Yeah. Yeah. The impact well, of I, these top predators. Yes. And I wonder too, if they're having the, then the same effect that the, the wolves, when they reintroduced them to Montana and areas, mm -hmm. they found that there was a reforestation effect. The reforestation effect came from deer who are now wanting to spend more time in open areas where, where, the, uh, where, the, where they could look out for wolves. And so we're dropping seeds out in the fields. And so then, then trees would, would be growing there. And I don't it know. It was also because there were less deer to eat trees, though. And there were also less deer eating the Yeah, sap. <laughs> that was a big part of it. <laughs> yeah. And it's all a part of it, though. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. a lot of deer. They're going to eat the trees. It's going to be bad for the forest and all the other animals. It's you get the wolves like in, the wolves are killing the killing the deer. It is <laughs> interconnected. Mm -hmm. Like a mm -hmm. system? Yeah. The but one that's biological. An uh -huh. ecosystem. Uh -huh. hmm. There it is. Whoop. There it is. That's, what, that's where we all are. And speaking of those ecosystems, humans have huge impacts being the impactful animals that we are on this planet. And we've talked a lot about how, uh, how naval operations and the sound of ships and motors, these giant vessels uh, crossing waters, what the effects they might have on marine life. But, uh, group of researchers just published in Frontiers in Amphibian and Reptile Science. Their work done at Fort Carson U.S. Military Installation near Colorado Springs, where there's lots of transport F aircraft, F-16s, Chinook, Apache, Black Hawk helicopters, all these big aircraft coming in landing, leaving regularly, and in the area there are uh, a number of animals we don't usually pay attention to, but uh, these researchers were checking out the whiptail lizard. So the Colorado checkered whiptail lizard is, is uncommon, but there are several populations of them in the area around this Air Force installation. So the researchers actually coordinated with the military to have them spend about a week without doing any landings or, or any or takeoffs during a particular time period of the day. And then they measured the same hours of the day and had them, you know, had them do certain flyovers and landings and all sorts of things. Anyway, what they found is that it, 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 the, the sound affected the lizards. They grabbed, they sampled the lizards. They checked out males and females. They looked to see at the females, how many eggs they had, what kind of cortisol, their stress hormones, how they were affected. They also looked at uh, glucose, ketones, reactive oxygen metabolites, like uh, alkoxy and hyperox, hydroperoxy free radicals, um, which are released by mitochondria during stress. So basically they're figuring out how stressed out all of the aircraft were making 
the lizards and in doing all of this they found out that yeah the lizards were uh, getting stressed out but they they didn't move around a lot more they didn't go hide a lot more uh, they tended to have this mobilization of energy resources and they started eating more hmm. the lizards were stress eating wow biologically yeah. why <laughs> because the stress was mobilizing energy resources to deal with uh, uh the, I see. all of the, all of the um, mm -hmm. oxygen use and the increase in cortisol and the females right. that were reproductive at the time seemed to be more susceptible they had a higher increase in cortisol but mm -hmm. so they didn't they weren't running around a lot more because that would be potentially putting themselves into danger, but they right. were finding more food and eating more food so that they could keep up with the energy. Like it's like right. you get, they're on high alert. They're yeah. on high alert. And they're, yeah. just, ah, you know, just if you, you know, run into people who've had way too much coffee in the morning, that's <laughs> they're vibrating. Ah. And you said they tested yeah. males and females. Yes, they tested so males these are, and females. These are not the whiptail lizards that are all female. Then I don't believe so. No, they. Okay. Test, yeah, no. <laughs> okay, because I was like, whiptail lizards aren't they all female? But I think there's not only these. some species of whiptail lizards. No, these were okay. it was males and females, and because they didn't want Got to it. influence the females of the population too much, they made sure to mark their mark the individuals they caught and only caught every female one time. Okay. We're not gonna we're not gonna stress you out nice. even more, but yeah. So there were mm -hmm. uh, big big decibels on flyover dates. Noise readings at ground level ranged from 30, 33, 34 decibels up to about one hundred and twelve decibels. Nine uh, non flyover dates, it was about thirty to fifty five decibels. So, so there the, was a, the question a is doubling like, of of noise level. Will this result in anything? Seems like no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to change anything at all. No. But um, but it is an interesting uh, way for researchers to understand how these human activities do impact animals. And if the animals are uh, having to find more food, to burn more calories, to just exist in an area, which they seem to be doing just fine as there are... Mm -hmm several populations in that in that particular time it is an adaptation to stress eat <laughs> in these in these this particular species well and i guess if you identified an endangered species and it had a breeding season you could reduce your, your fly days in that time yeah you wouldn't, i don't know no. No, I know not, it's not going to happen. It, or maybe be a concern. Anyway. Or maybe you can. Or maybe you can change. Uh, you know the the lower level of the flight deck so that uh, planes and helicopters that are coming in don't go below a certain altitude. Or maybe there's a you know you shift out of a certain area during a period of time and approach the the landing strip from another direction. I, there are alterations, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, yeah lizards, mm -hmm. stress eating. Who knew? It happens. What else? Do we? Who? What do you want to talk about? You want to talk about some eyes now? What are we looking at, Justin? Uh, this is <laughs> Penn State researchers <laughs> are looking for a way to replace humans with robots. Oh, great. Okay. Now, I'm not now, stressed and, at all. Yeah. Now, this is not because the researchers prefer robots over humans in terms of robotic companionship or anything like this, but because engineers who we trust with designing safety into every build that they make don't trust humans when it comes to safety. <laughs> well, there's enough, so, enough examples of... Uh, not just mistakes, but um, overlooking things for monetary gain that uh, maybe machines could do a better job. But yeah, in this wrong. case, they're looking at uh, at <clears throat> post stress, uh, I guess, building inspections. Uh, so, a building will show some sort of structural damage, 
maybe due to a natural disaster or a, an earlier poor structural design that's now showing up with age. And so what we do is we send in safety ex inspectors uh, who are humans to assess the damage before any occupants can return to the building. Researchers at the Penn State Department of Agricultural Engineering studied how building inspectors make their assessments by analyzing gaze patterns with eye tracking software. So what they were, they were kind of interested in doing uh, long term is, is training robots, maybe drones, to go into one of these stressed buildings and they they figured by by testing people who have been trained engineers in 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 you know structural damage and how to assess it they could teach the robots where to look and what to look at this is a quoting from a corresponding author rebecca napolitano we are looking for a way to capture how an inspector thinks and makes assessments on a building site to understand their intentions and diagnostic choices, studying where they look and for how long at certain points on a building can help them do that. So they asked 10 architectural engineering graduates to assess two building facades while wearing these eye tracking glasses. These glasses have two cameras to measure movements and positioning of the eyes simultaneously. So they picked, of course, facades of buildings that had, you know, an interesting uh, array of peeling paint, degrading bricks, cracks, some water uh, intrusion and erosion up near the foundation. And their data was all over the place. Each of the inspectors looked at something. They, they all looked at everything. Okay. But some lingered much have much longer on certain aspects, on certain features. And they ended up assessing that if one of the, one of the assessors had experience with water damage in the past, they were more interested in the water damage feature than the, the foundation crack maybe, or the peeling paint. Or if somebody else had, had been studying more the, the integrity of bricks, the cracks seemed more important, the water damage and the peeling paint and all that. So they all sort of had a bias, which uh, both made the entire study useless. No, which does, the, <laughs> does mean that, the, the, you know, maybe there's a good reason to have a robot that's looking at all things sort of equally. Maybe it's not. Maybe it needs to be trained on what's the more important thing. It, you know, it's sort of, I, I, I don't know how much they can pull from it uh, because everybody had such a different approach. The other thing is, if I was being asked to do this experiment and I just spent years in engineering learning how to assess building damage and then the other smart uh, software kids came over and was like, oh yeah, we want to track your eyes and see how you do it so we can train a robot to take your job. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to look at all the nonsense. And they're like, oh, yeah, you got to look up at the clouds. That's the really important part. Uh, when you're discussing building damage, you got to stare at the clouds or maybe the ground. No. I think it's interesting they're trying to train robots on humans when the hypothesis of it all is that a robot could be less like subjective than a human. Yeah. So, so it seems very counterintuitive to me. Yeah, and as Daniel Smith is saying in our YouTube chat, most structural problems are interrelated, and that is that is a point I wanted to bring up, is that, you know, if there is water damage, that can cause structural damage leading to cracks, and if you've got different kinds of materials at play, maybe the water, the pH, is going to influence the deter deter deterioration of those materials more or less. Um, yeah, so it's all interrelated, and and so... You have to, you know, maybe it is that an, a, a machine learning system can be able to put it together, all the pieces together more effectively than an individual who has been training for a long period of time. I don't know. What is, hmm. what is it? It's supposed to be 10 years or 10,000 hours of work before you, you get before the... Before you're an expert. Just, before you're an expert and you just kind of know things. 
that you can't really explain anymore. It's probably because you've seen all those interrelated issues more than once. But yeah. But why would why would testing where the eyes are looking be better than just giving a robot a list of things to check? Yeah, like I, I thought that was. <laughs> I mean, the the construct of this study, I, I think my guess is, and this is this is this is just a guess, that they got access to these eye tracking software glasses first, and which sounds cool, came, and then came up with a way to use them. Well, I could be wrong, but that would be my guess. That would definitely be my guess. Although you know the the the, the other but thing like is, you, that, but like you said, Justin, like if you had any idea and you were an expert and you're like, oh, the robots take take the future future jobs, take my job. If you were gonna bias things, you know, yeah. maybe reporting, uh, you know, filling out a spreadsheet would be less accurate. Than- well, the other thing is the machine learning aspect of it versus the human expert sort of hidden knowledge kind of thing. Is going to be tricky because you can imagine like a machine learning AI building inspecting robot deciding that all historical structures must be taken down. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it's demolished immediately. There's cracks, there's, there's water damage, there's moths. This thing's too old. Get rid of it. Makes a difference also where it is. You know, here in Denmark, there's, a, there's plenty of 500 year old buildings sitting around. No big deal. But in San Francisco, there is nothing that is more than like 50 years old, probably. <laughs> years All old. right. That's a I bit mean, of an I, exaggeration. I will, oh, uh, exaggeration. Yeah. Still. Yeah. When was the big 19, 19 or something? The oh, big six. Earth, 19, was yeah. it 1906 was the big one Yeah. that uh, knocked the whole city down it, pretty much? It burned about half the city. Yeah. A lot of buildings still remained, though. There yeah. were some, they, there were some big ones that down. Most of them burned down. They just burned because the yeah. water pipelines broke and you couldn't yeah. put out the fire with yeah. hoses. Yeah. This is also to add to the multiple times that the various gangs in town got angry and, like, the Italian mafia decided it was time to just burn down one area of town. And What? Oops. Oh, Why yeah. Why is everybody always blaming the Italians? <laughs> no. No. There are some great stories. There are some, some really great stories. Of old in San Francisco? San Francisco. Oh. Yes. Mm. Yes. Burned down on purpose many times. Not just oh, during, not just during disasters, earthquakes. Uh, but sometimes you can prevent disasters, and we are hoping, looking for ways that we can prevent the next flu pandemics and other uh, uh, viral pandemics. Researchers have been looking as well for more of a, a a global vaccine. Let's call it a global vaccine. Something that you can use to vac- vaccinate against all flu strains and a group from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital just published their work on the H3N2 flu virus in science advances. And they were looking at one part, the H part of the flu virus, the H part and the N part. The H part is called the hemagglutinin part. And that is the part that gets into cells that basically finds a cell and goes, I'm going to stab you and I'm going to invade you. And that's the hemagglutinin part. And so that's the part that a lot of researchers are looking at and they're like, maybe we can do something to make a vaccine that addresses the H part of the flu virus. And that'll be good for all, all of them. And nobody will get sick from the flu anymore. So they found that this hemagglutinin needs to be really stable and also resistant to acidity to be really effective. And the hemagglutinin, um, it has to get past, so you have like mildly acidic cells in your nasal cavity, and then even past that in your lungs, apparently it's like more highly acidic. And the researchers found that There's a mutation in hemagglutinin that makes a virus grow better in eggs and causes a mismatch, makes the vaccine incorrect 
And so the mutation makes the virus, mm. the little part, unstable, and it doesn't it doesn't work well as a vaccine. So what they're determining, what they've pretty much determined, is that the amount of acidity or the pH that the hemagglutinin in part that is controlled by this particular mutation in the H of the hemagglutinin, that it reacts to the acidity in the cells. And it needs to be able to get past the nose to get into the lungs to cause the real, the real flu problems. And so they need, they now know, have determined because of the acidity that they have seen the hemagglutinin react to, that perhaps one way they can test to see whether or not their vaccines are going to work in the, ne in the next year to prevent a pandemic from happening is to test their vaccines against different pH levels to see where the, the hemagglutinin breaks down and um, whether or not it will actually, whether or not it's actually going to work. So can I pause so, it for a second real quick? So is the yeah. idea that the vaccines that we have made already are losing the structure that the T cells would need because by the time it's been produced in the egg and then reproduced, I guess the vaccine doesn't have the structure of the original. Yes, or that okay. the the virus that's gone around a bit has yeah. changed enough that it's already, um, yeah, already different enough that it's still going to make it past those defenses. Um, yeah, so there, but but when you come down to kind of more of a, a pharmacokinetics aspect of you know how the virus is attaching to a receptor, so receptor binding, um, it's this is driven by acidity apparently with the hemagglutinin part of the flu virus. And so if we can, uh, if we can address the hemagglutinin stability, it might be able to, we, we might be able to figure out, number one, whether or not a particular flu virus is more likely to cause a pandemic. And number two, by looking at our vaccines and the bits that we're using for the vaccines, how well they might work against the different strains. So it could be a, down to a simple acid test. To or discover. next cold cold season, yeah. Take a couple of lemon wedges and shove them up your nose <laughs> to make your nose more acidic. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So acidity. I, I I had no idea that you know the environment in your sinuses is, is slightly less acidic. It's more mildly acidic than uh, the the lung environment. It's a little bit different. And the pandemic virus has to hit that sweet spot to be able to make it through the gauntlet huh. for infection. Yeah, no idea. Anyway, acid. It's how we may, may discover the, uh, the next pandemic flu virus to be able to defend against it. Fingers crossed. And, oh, Blair, by the way, um, if you ever have gone out into the field and gotten all those little sticky invasive burr things stuck all yeah. over your pants those, and your socks. Those little jerks. The little ones. Yeah. All the all the little cockle, cockle birds is what they're called. These little cockle birds. Um, the worst. You always think you got them all and then you get home and there's one, you step on one or there's one between your toe yeah. or or there's ah. one, you know, a bunch that go on to create nasty little um, hair, hair knots in the back mm -hmm. of your dog's legs or yes. whatever they're not wonderful the cockleburs we don't like them they're invasive for one thing who wants them no wonder but perhaps <laughs> <laughs> perhaps these nasty invasive annoying weeds could be useful to fight aging what I'm sorry yeah Sh should i eat them no, do no. not eat them. No. Uh, so how, do you so, Blair, how do you immediately go? So here's number one. Do not a eat good, them. I will the eat <laughs> this <laughs> wild weed just in uh, hopes that <laughs> the thing that science discovered somehow translates into me just being able to eat the thing. Well, that, no. that, is, that is a cue into my, my uh, anti-aging uh, 
methods that I don't do a lot of topical applications, which is probably what well, this is good. actually that's good. doing. Can that's you good. eat your way are, to ridiculous. a healthier life? In a certain respect, yes, but not <laughs> with cockleburs. Cockleburs okay, can be extremely harmful. The fruit extract can be harmful. Apparently, it has a constituent that's toxic, carboxyattractylicide. Carboxyattractylicide. It can hurt your liver. Isn't that great? So you don't want, you don't, no, okay, no, no. So definitely don't eat it. Got it. No cockleburr fruit extract. Don't do, don't okay. go there. Additionally, um, so this, this extract from the plant that they, uh, that they, that they studied, this is the first time they have looked at it in its particular role as a potential wound healing agent and skin protectant. It's been explored for rheumatoid arthritis and cancer previously, but this time, you're like, oh, what can it do for the skin? And it has a lot of compounds that can help with anti-inflammation, -infl antioxidants. Uh, they were able to show that it influenced collagen production, benefited wound he healing, and also benefited damage from um, UVB radiation in the skin. So it can be, and also be protective against UVB radiation. So perhaps sunscreens eventually will be developed that have cockleburr fruit extract included in them. Oh, okay, but hang on. Before we go all cockleberry <laughs> about everything. Before we go, yeah, what? go off <laughs> half, half cockleburred. Yeah. <laughs> is there a mechanism? Because then I'm like, why does, what is it? Because aren't we past the point where, uh, you know, Magical plant has yeah. interesting effect. Like Justin, it, have you looked at the beauty industry lately? Because no. <laughs> no, I know that's how they don't I know that's not how they advertise things. <laughs> but but that's gotta be at some level. So that's this that's the next question. Is the researchers because they have found these influences on collagen and uh, UVB protection uh, that they are going to study the biological mechanisms involved. So they don't know yet how exactly they do the this cockleburr juice does what it does. Mm -hmm. Second point here is that uh, the collagen synthesis seems to take place in a very special happy spot, a little sweet spot where at low levels, it doesn't do very much. In a little perfect place, it helps. Increases collagen synthesis, but then if it goes past a particular point, it starts to be harmful and do bad things. Hmm. And so if, I'm just going to put this out there, if you start seeing <laughs> cosmetic pro products in the next few weeks, a yeah. couple months with cockleburr extract in them, I would suggest potentially avoiding them until more, more information is out uh, because there is not an understanding of the proper concentration to be using in cosmetic products at this point in time. Yeah. The, the thing so I'm check. finding so, interesting. So keep, keep using my generic face uh, sunscreen and that's all. Eat, eat blueberries. You got it. You know, like have a good mediterranean diet get your fish oils in there and age know. gracefully i suppose <laughs> I, I, yeah you do what you can with that yeah <laughs> or sorry. otherwise just age otherwise, you could also age. just do that it's true it's, you know what that's gonna happen no matter what you want yeah. to do it is yeah. sunny knocks in the chat room saying my my grandma did the vix thing to me and i had that too when my grandma's that was also my grandma's go-to you get a cold you put vix all over the chest and just like sleep like this and he just had mentholation uh, <laughs> all over you for the night the only thing one of the things that when i'm looking at this uh or at least the press release of this study is this is I mean, I don't, I don't want to judge too much, but we, if they're st stating that they don't know what the con right concentrations or exactly how it works. But this was uh, a South Korean uh, study who are known for their cosmetics industry. Wait, wait. Oh, who are also what? pointing out that you also the best cockleburra out there is in Southern 
Korea, don't get the Chinese stuff. Because that's true. not... They're saying this in the paper, and I'm like, look at this. Like, what do you mean you just told us you don't understand the right concentrations of how it works? But it's you're already true. willing to say, oh, but the South Korean is the best... Uh, don't get the Chinese version when Our you get this. Better. Yep. Our yep. plant's better, but we don't know how or why or if. Like, I'm... Uh, I've got my uh, my a big big Justin skeptical asterisk now floating from that throwaway think, comment. Yeah, that's in there. yeah. I think we could, you know, a, a lot of things that are potentially going to be helpful for cosmetics industry stuff. There, uh, we should be a little skeptical skeptical of to begin with, because but but only but only use the cockroaches. That are grown in my backyard, because th those are the good ones, and the rest you won't see the same effect. It won't. I think the big take-home message here is: don't <laughs> drink cockleburr juice. Yeah. Don't go. Don't go rubbing your face in the cockleburr bush. Okay, uh. this is not a good idea. Don't do that. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah, we should teach that to all the kids. I know they won't listen. Kids never listen to the adults in the room. But if you're a kid and you're listening to This Week in Science right now, know that we appreciate you being here. All of us, lifetime kids, kids forever, people with kids who wish that they listened to us. <sighs> anyway, we're all a big family here who appreciate science, and we are so glad that you are a part of the This Week in Science audience. Thank you for joining us. And in the next part of the show, we're going to have a lot more uh, fun and fantasticness. But before we get there, I just want to remind you that in case you are really enjoying This Week in Science and want to be a part of helping us do our show every single week as we do, you can head over to twist.org, click on our Patreon link, and be, uh, choose your level of support. Every, every level, every bit of support helps us do what we do. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for all of your support. And on that, we will come back with This Week in Science 2, Blair's Animal Corner. Hold on. I have to scroll. I didn't scroll in time. Do, 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 scrolling to Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. About animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a what you got, Blair? Hey, we were just talking about being skeptical. I want to talk to you about skeptical fish. So, uh, fish. Wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we um, we picture I, them like like hey hey fishy bob I, I i just i don't know about what you're saying there right there fishy bob it's more uh, like fishy bob darted away like there's a predator i don't know if i believe him i'm gonna stay here mm. so in the coral reef fish some of them swim alone some of them swim in groups some of them school they're paying attention to each other so even though there's a bunch of different species of fish in the coral reef um, they're all kind of paying to attention to each other to be aware for predators. Everybody's getting eaten by something, right? When fish around them startle, any fish around them is more likely to flee themselves. But in these large dense schools where fish around them can dart for no reason, then individuals might be more willing to take risks and tune down sensitivity to the startle response of other fish around them. So that makes them less likely to free when a neighboring fish does. So this is an analysis of footage from underwater camera observations in um, specifically coral reef fish in Moorea, French Polynesia. Um, they looked at individuals in schools of wild foraging fish as they fleed for shelter or not, even when there was a no predator or threat present. And they would do this on average, about every eight minutes. It's a very frantic life. <laughs> so they collected all of these observations. They used new computer vision tools, machine learning, and computational modeling to analyze their behavior. 
And they found that these fish do in fact adjust their sensitivity to the signals produced by others based on the past history of what they've seen. So they basically acclimate to the social environment they're in and uh, adjust their responsiveness to that. So when there's a lot of visual motion, they kind of reduce their sensitivity to it. They're just like, ah, oh, everybody's just moving around a lot. It doesn't really mean anything. When there's less visual motion, when everything is pretty still and all of a sudden somebody darts, that increases their sensitivity. Now they go, oh gosh, maybe there's a real threat. I should also flee. So we call this a dynamic adjusting of sensitivity, which is something that, um, you can look for in animals and actually appears to be pretty preserved throughout the animal kingdom. So there's an idea that this is kind of um, an ancestral trait from fish that has carried on through the rest of vertebrates, potentially. I don't know. Who knows? More study is needed. Um, but so... Uh, wow. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a leap, but... What an yeah. interesting one. Well, I mean, it, it's if we can figure out when, in, like, we were talking about AI. Was this in the after show maybe last week? Mm -hmm. We were talking about uh, AI learning about lies and truth. It, in any system, it's going to be beneficial, right, for this the individuals in that system to know who's lying, when to trust, when not to trust, what's what's misinformation, what's real information. Yes, yes. So that's exactly yeah. it, is that any brain, specifically a more complicated vertebrate brain um, in social situations, have a need to cope with misinformation. And that that could be driven by evolution because you don't want to waste energy unnecessarily a bunch. You also don't want to ignore important signals and then get eaten. Right. So, yeah. Evolutionarily, there's a lot of benefits to... to being able to tell the difference. Yeah. Who to trust, who not to trust. When Fishy Bob, like you said, he's the one who's like, ha ha ha, I'm going to make them think there's an attack, someone attacking. I'm going to zip this way. And he does it one too many times, you know, and then there's the fish crying wolf sheep. Sheep. Wolf eel? Wolf eel. There we go. Thank you. Yes, yes you're welcome. <laughs> I'm here for it. Uh, yeah. So th that is the, the kind of the suggestion from this is that this could be something that is conserved throughout the animal kingdom. Possible would make sense, especially because um, they claim that it's a very basic neural circuit that's at work here. Um, and so because of the simplicity, that could be widespread and conserved throughout evolution. So it's, it's possible, but... Yes, much, 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 much more study would be needed to figure this out. Much, much, much more. In the meantime, we know that fish assess the quality of information given to them by their peers. Yeah. So now, but now, but now, okay. So they've been they've been looking at these small groups. So is it these, is it possible? Is it that that some people so is it possible? Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, is it is it all the fish? Every kind they were of looking fish? at one just... species in this yeah. case. So you're right. They need to, first and foremost, look at other fish. <laughs> that is step like zero, basically, yeah. in extrapolating <laughs> this data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can I also extrapolate that it means that some people are less skeptical or handle misinformation worse than a fish would? Yes, and before <laughs> modern time, they would not have survived to reproduce. Yeah. That is the expectation here. Yeah. Oh, oh uh -huh. no. Uh -huh. We've created a system uh -huh. where... Uh... Hey, listen, we've created a, a system where very little selective <laughs> pressure actually exists yeah. at this time. So, like... That's true. Unless I mean, you make your own fatal mistakes on your own bodily person, it is pretty hard to select out specific things in humans. But uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think most much of the last century got rid of all the people who don't know who don't have the instinct to look left and right before crossing a road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't know about that. I Next think that's been reduced years. quite a bit. I don't know. <laughs> 
soon as they had covered wagons on highways and to figure it out. Um, hey, do you ever wish you were invisible? No. All the time. Never. Oh, yes. Opposites, I see. Yeah. <laughs> no, because people would be running into you all the time. It'd be totally annoying. Talk about trying to cross the street. Uh, even if you look left and right, you can't expect anyone to ever slow down for you, even a little bit. <laughs> right? People well, just you, constantly you, walking into you. You would you make a terrible squid or octopus then, Justin. <laughs> Standing be- there at the counter waiting to make your order for food and... They're back there cleaning the kitchen like you don't even exist. No, you see, be, you turn, I would be turn it on and off at will. Yeah, as a mother, I would be, oh, sitting on the couch reading a book, and suddenly I'd put, Mom, where are you? Put my book down, go invisible, nobody can see me. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be found in the house. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, but... well, if that's something you wanted, someday... You could have that thanks to squid and octopus cells. Not really. Uh, really, this study is about um, using cultured human skin cells to play with the mechanics of cephalopod cells and how they can camouflage and appear transparent. And of course, right away when I teased this story, somebody said, if you were transparent, your organs would show. So that's not actually what's happening with octopuses and squids. They are matching their environment. They are changing the reflectivity of these structures in their skin cells to appear like they're not there. So they're not they're not turning their skin transparent and then you can see their their innards. <laughs> they're blending in with their environment. And so uh, a lot of the mechanics with how this works, are still being figured out. Scientists are still flabbergasted on a lot of the the ways that this happens in the cell and the triggers that happen in these cells. The issue is you can't, at this point, culture squid cells in a lab. You can't do it. So the whole point of this study was to replicate the tunable transparency of squid skin cells in mammalian skin cells, which can be cultured. So that was, that was, that was step one. They were able to get this kind of transparency structure in mammalian skin cells. Awesome. So now they get to manipulate it and figure out how the heck it works. (laughs) And so this all came from a lab that had made invisibility stickers, which I can't remember if we talked about it on the show or not, but it sounds very familiar. It, yeah. it used bacterially produced squid reflectin proteins that were adhered onto sticky tape. So they made these invisibility stickers. Very cool. So then they were like, well, if we were able to use it through bacteria, what if we could do it in mammalian cells? So they tried to capture the aspect of the ability of squid skin tissues to change transparency within human cell cultures. This is from University of California, Irvine. They, so in the cephalopod cells, there are leucophores, which have particle, a particulate-like nanostructures compo- composed of reflectin proteins that scatter light. It's a bunch of nouns you don't really need to know. So basically, <laughs> these these these. these specific proteins called reflectins, they clump together and form nanoparticles so light isn't absorbed or directly transmitted. Instead, it scatters, it bounced off of them, it makes them appear bright white. So they can adjust the clumping of the reflectin to adjust the wavelength of light that gets sent back, if any at all. That's the and part so, that's amazing is like, yes. I mean, just first off, you have cephalopods who are able to uh, sense the colors of their surroundings and then somehow control all uh-huh. of this, the, the reflectance, which are little nanoparticles inside of their cells to create little reflective nanostructures that reflect at that specific Perfect. Frequency right. of so, light. That they, yeah, that's amazing. In number this one, study, and now we're figuring that yeah. out. We are okay. completely shelving the question of how they figure out how to do what that. they should look like. Right. Yeah. So, like, 
that's for later. <laughs> yeah. Right now, <laughs> it's just, can we do it? Can we yeah. do this in cells? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So um, they were, they wanted to see if they could engineer mammalian cells to um, form these reflected nanostructures stably. So they wouldn't immediately kind of like fall back apart so that they could control the scattering of light. So um, they introduced squid derived genes that encoded for reflectin into human cells. They then used the DNA to produce the protein, the reflectins. And what they found worked for them was that introducing salt to the cell culture changed the clumping of the, the nanostructures. And so systematically increasing the salt concentration allowed them to get detailed time-lapse 3D images of nanostructure properties. As they became larger, the amount of light that bounced off the cells increased. That turned their opacity up. So um, if cells allow the light through with little scattering, they're more transparent. If uh, If the scattering happens a lot, then they appear opaque and more apparent. It's called. Um, so then what's really funny is uh, right in the middle of this very exciting study, the COVID pandemic hit. Ah, we're it's one we're of gonna those. continue to hear this in all of our studies, like how did they pivot and still learn anything? Mm-hmm. So at that time, the lead researcher um, developed computational models that could predict a cell's expected light scattering and transparency before an experiment was ever run. So he was able right. to figure out like what should I do in the lab when I can get back in there <laughs> to maximize my time and figure out how to manipulate the reflectin in the right way? Um, and so from all of this, the results are that they think that scientists be- will be able to better understand from this kind of data set um, how squid skin synth squid skin cells say that five times fast function um without having ever cultured squid skin cells right um and so uh salt is obviously a big part of the the question here in how they have manipulated it now there's a question of is salt concentration something being manipulated in the squid is that part of the methodology in their skin or did we just find a workaround, right? In mammalian skin yeah. cells, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, there's a bunch of applications, of course, potentially of using reflectin and all sorts of things. Uh, one of the really cool yeah. ones is that you could use it as a molecular p- probe um, to track structures in cells with advanced microscopy techniques because they can't be mm-hmm. bleached. Right. And it could also have implications for better understanding of cell growth and development if you can use it as kind of a tracking substance. So lots of cool things there. Of course, also there's the opportunity to make uh, biological structures with reflectin in them that could change their opacity, right? Of course, that's obviously what I was thinking about. But it's kind of, this is step, you know, or this is clothing. step 1A. <laughs> could, we have, could we have biological basic like yes. leather jackets? Would you have to feed it though? Or would you have to be, (laughs) would you have to like take your saline drip with you everywhere? Right. You, yeah. You, instead of taking your, uh, your cephalopod skin jacket out of the closet, you're taking it out of the, uh, saline storage tank. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, they have some ideas here. They have a methodology to do more experiments, which is really great. Um, but yes, at the end of the day, even if they figure out exactly how reflectin works and how you can physically manipulate it molecularly, right? You mm-hmm. still have to figure out how the squid's nervous system is telling yeah. it what to do. Yeah. So this is a, a huge onion of questions and will remain one i think for quite a while and i can't wait to find out more this is very exciting yeah reflectin yes what will science do with it there are so many so many ways it can proceed i still want to take that big question down from the shelf but we'll leave it there for now oh yeah it has to stay there for right now (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) leave the big question on on the Uh shelf Leave, uh-huh. leave the jacket in the saline tank. Um, if you are enjoying This Week in Science, you can also head to twist.org 
and click on the Zazzle link and then go to our Zazzle store where we have all sorts of very cool products that you might actually put on a shelf or in a closet or on a wall or on a couch or re really real products that you're not going to have to wait for some far off long future date to actually get, you know, and in purchasing them, you do help support the show. But Justin, what do you want to talk about? So uh, this is uh, out of, re this is research from the Francis Crick Institute published this week in Current Biology. They looked at the diversity of genes coding for immunity in some really old people. This is uh, about uh, Near East Europeans about 8,000 years ago came in mixed uh, into, the, into Europe for the first time. They have 677 individuals dating from Stone Age Europe. They wanted to see what these early farmers immune systems looked like so they have the the whole genome sequencing they found something pretty interesting actually uh, so according to this about 20 percent of the ancestry of uh, late stone age people was traced to the local indo-european hunter gatherers but what they found from the study is that 50% of the immunity genes from this smaller contributing population were present in the early farmers. So you have maybe 20% admixture uh, initially with the hunter-gatherers, but more than half, around half, maybe a little more than half, of the immune genes derived from that local population. So this is, I think, kind of interesting because one of the things that we know happens when humans switch to agriculture and farming is that they were suddenly beset by all sorts of new diseases. Uh, we shrank by several inches in terms of average height. You know, this was not a, this was not an easy transition by any means. With this sort of this study, sort of supports that, showing that there could have been. Uh, an exposure to a lot of things that humans weren't used to before. But what's also interesting is that the local population that had been existing in Europe for thousands of years may have already had immunity to whatever these new farmers were experiencing because their immune systems were selected preferably in keeping that, that farming population alive. Also kind of shows that the, the diversity that admixture of different populations increased, I say increased immunity, we're only, we may only be looking at the survivors, <laughs> right? The, yeah. Anybody exactly. who didn't look both ways got hit by the mastodon or whatever was running around 8,000 years ago, right? So, so whoever was, uh, was, was, didn't have immunity to the local diseases did die off. So we're only looking at the survivors, but it shows a, a, for the for the amount of population that's thought to have contributed to these Stone Age farmers, uh, quite a bit of it came from the local hunter gatherers, who may have had a more robust or in a more uh, locally attuned immune system. That's fascinating. Yeah, that the the, I mean, they're local. They're huntering, huntering, huntering and gathering, <laughs> yeah, hunting and gathering in the local ecosystem. And so perhaps that and if they've been doing that for a very long time, then perhaps that has had a massive uh, influence on the adaptation of their immune systems. Um, but yeah, that it, it then individuals coming in and trade happening and the inter the ad mixing, right? The admixing up. with a with a heavy preference for the local immune system, yeah. and it's it's one of these things too. As we as we are now encountering global, is it it's redundant to say global pandemic? Is we're encountering the age of the novel virus pandemics? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting thing to realize that we may not be done with all the bottlenecking <laughs> or the the mass. Uh, selections on population from disease unless unless science can get there first 
and and come up with ways to avoid having natural selection applied to us humans. Well, potentially, you know, could we figure out what microorganisms are in various places? I mean, we do prophylactic vaccinations for people who are going to certain areas of, uh, of sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, or to India or other places. When you're traveling globally, there are certain diseases that we don't have to be inoculated against here in the United States, but they go, you should get, you should get vaccinated for that before you leave. Um you know, but if there were more understanding of that, you know, what are, what are in the local area, what is in the local area, what kind of bacteria, what viruses, is there some kind of probiotic prophylactic that you could, that you could take for a couple of weeks and, uh, and get your immunity up before you even get someplace. Yeah. And what, how would that influence things globally too? I don't know. Fascinating. Last story I brought tonight uh, is an interesting article on phys.org about the death of open access mega journals, question <laughs> mark. So, so there's a big stress test that's been happening in scientific publishing for a while, and there's more coming. Uh, when, is, uh, when we talk about traditional publishing, the... And uh, the way it kind of used to work is that universities, research institutions all paid a subscription to a handful of publishers who produced a number of journals with papers in it. <clears throat> now, if you have this subscription, you could read all of these articles, which was very, which was very handy for researchers to keep up with what's going on in other universities and what other research is being done. And... And if you were part of one of these institutions, it was also a pipeline to do your own publishing because the fees for publishing were all covered by this subscription, usually, generally speaking. So that's sort of how publishing worked for a long time. If you wanted to just read a science article, uh, you know, on the Internet, for instance, you would have to either make this institutional subscription that nobody can afford or buy each article at an obscene price, right? This is, and so open access uh, journalism in, uh, in the scientific field came along and we had things like PLOS One, uh, scientific advances mm -hmm. that started publishing scientific research papers in a way that everybody could read them. So this was like, ah, this is finally, we are allowing this to happen. So the model that they used was, though, they would charge whoever was uh, looking to get published, they would charge them a fee to process the paper, to do yes. the reviews, and then and this is how they made their money. So one is you just have a, a subscription-based paywall. The next was everybody who uh, applies has to pay to get their paper in just to t handle the, the bills. And then everybody can read this research. It can be shared freely. There's no paywall involved. Well, the mega journals came about when they realized, hey, there's a lot of people who would be willing to pay to have their journal, their paper published. And so we're going to take lots and lots and lots of those and charge higher and higher fees and, and make a decent amount of money. And we'll make it all open to the public so everybody can see it and then so this is, this is the mega journals started where they started publishing larger and larger volumes. Now, some of those are plus one and uh, was it scientific advances, I think was the other one I was mentioning, or scientific reports, excuse me. Yeah, uh, but, I, but I was going to say plus one is one that, it, that was started, it's one, it was probably, that was the very first, well, yeah. Pl yeah, plus the Public Library of Science was the first open access yeah. research journal and it, that it's the first one that tried the model and it grew and it grew and it i think is the biggest or not the biggest but it's mega because it kept going and it gathered a lot of support and then looking down this list of various uh of various other journals you've got scientific reports which is springer you have uh nature communications which is also springer you've got frontiers in immunology immunology which is the frontiers line you have mdpi as a publisher for a lot of them elsevier is another mega there are a lot of already big name 
publishers of scientific journals who jumped in after they saw that this was yes. an opportunity. So there's a big yeah. conversion to this. So yeah. So what in the traditional uh, method, they, they didn't care about the number of papers in the traditional old school subscription yeah. base. What they got paid was for the number of journals, basically. So they would yeah. come up with more and more journals that were more yeah. and more specific to topics. And they would package those up as parts of the subscription. What uh, initially, like PLOS One, is very general. You'll find papers Everything. from across the scientific field. Same thing with scientific reports. But then now, they specialized, right? Now there's they PLOS started One, specializing. PLOS Bio, PLOS Computer, whatever's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so now the specialization, there was some fear that maybe this is going to start infringe on traditional scientific publishing because they're publishing a lot more than anybody else. Okay. In these in these specific ones and it's yeah. and it's open that everybody can read, so why wouldn't you? So there's a there's a whole other aspect to this. Some of this gets kind of kind of crazy. There's uh uh this is the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, which is an MDPI published uh, journal, published 16,889 full articles in 2022. Now, compare that with the American Journal of Public Health, which published 514 articles, the European Journal of Public Health, 238 articles. American Journal of Epidemiology had 222 articles the same year that this one journal, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, somehow managed to publish 16,889 full articles. So one of the things, though, that affects is impact factor. Impact factor is how journals are rated, and it can tie into how your paper is perceived because the prestigiousness of the journal that you've published in can be something you can levy uh, in your research to get grant funding or maybe mm -hmm. to get promotions within the university to get tenure, that sort of thing. Impact Factor is create, uh, curated by this company called Clarative Analytics Web of Science Group. They have this very interesting formula where they use the average sum of citations received in a given year and two years previous, and then divide that by the sum of the citable publications over the past couple of years. So what's happened then is there's this gigantic push to cite journals to get their impact factor higher. Mm -hmm. And this has always kind of been a thing, but it got really kind of out of control. So some of the big online journals, PLOS One and Scientific Reports, PLOS One self-cites 2% of the time. Scientific Reports cites itself about 3% of the time. The open access journals by MDPI, there's 11 of them uh, that, were, that were in the, this, this data set, uh, self-cited 12% of the time. It's a huge increase. And there's some fear that there ha there's been reports of uh, scientists being pressured by, you know, there's some that have been scandalously in the news. I think it was, uh, I'm going to get in trouble. Elsevier, I think, got in trouble because they uh, somebody got denied publishing because they didn't cite the journal enough. Oosh. That was a, a single yeah. issue, apparently. But there's lots of reports. These, this uh, pressure to self-cite tends to affect assistant professors more or people who are publishing for the first time they tend to get more pressure because they might be more susceptible to adding in citations that and then you know the research is like i don't care i'm this is my paper that's the important part not the citation so if you you know so but it's gotten a little out of control one uh journal animals has 22 percent rate of self-citation suggesting that a great deal of what we know about animals has all been published in this one journal. How else would 22% of the citations self-refer to the journal? Yeah. I mean, it, all it all animals. It, all everything, animals. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it I depends mean, on the type of yeah. study. Uh, the, that's a, it's, it's an so, interesting one. There's, but there's, yeah. there's also a thing, especially with, 
with animals where a specific lab will study a specific species and have a bunch of different publications about that one species. Mm -hmm. And if they are consistently publishing with the same journal, then that happens very easily. Yeah. And so some of this too is just by the volume, you could see these are specialty articles with 16,000 papers. They may all be interrelated and could all self-cite each other on some level. But on the other hand, there is this fear that this is playing with the algorithm of impact factor. And there's, there's some other questions. So now there's been a delisting that happened a little over a week ago. The uh, web of science, the folks that come up with that impact factor rating, removed nearly two dozen journals. Awesome. Including the International Journal of Environmental Research when it published the 6,889 studies in 2022 alone. Many of the journals were published by a publisher, Hindawi and MDPI, and had their impact factor ratings removed. So Hindawi is known for its, uh, I think it's known for the, the fraudulent studies or for a lot of fake studies. So it, in 20, journals. 2021, it wasn't. In 2020, yeah. it wasn't. 2021, it got bought by Wiley for $300 million. They wanted this confirmation because look, that one, it's not a, uh, it's the MDPI one, but that 1680 something in that one journal, 16,000 something, they yeah. charge an average of about $2,500 a study to publish there. Right. So, so this is a big business. Wiley saw this in uh, Hindawi and bought it for $300 million and then looked under the hood and then started issuing thousands of retractions. They were discovering papers that were filled, you know, they were finding thousands and tens of thousands of citations that did not seem to have anything to do with the subject matter of the studies. So it's they, as if those papers were written by machine learning. My machine learning. So here's the other fear. Here's the other fear. <laughs> On top of this, okay, so uh, this is, unfortunately, this is a little bit longer story. The, the, uh, the web science folks have, have put out a newsletter, not really explaining in detail why they delisted, in this case, 19 of the Hindawi journals got delisted. This They got rid of 50. Apparently, there's another wave of this coming. Uh, there's They're really removing their rating system from a lot of these mega journals, these big publishers. Uh, it says, <laughs> they don't go into details of what they chose, but they say, we have invested in new, this is from the vice president, uh, Nandita Quaderi, uh, vice president of Web of Science. We have invested in a new internally developed AI tool to help us identify outlier characteristics that an indicated journal may no longer meet our quality criteria. Very diplomatic. A couple of the things that might be a problem. Peer review process. You have suddenly tens of thousands of papers and not uh, hundreds uh, going through that, that they are constantly hiring this process of guest editors to review as, as peer reviewers who generally speaking may not be reviewing studies that have anything to do with their field of expertise. And I'm, I'm going to add to that. that There are complaints across acad uh, academia about the overloading of peer review because you are expected yeah. as part of your scientific expertise and community to peer review papers, but you do it for free. You do it, you're, you are asked by journals, editors all the time, can you review this paper? It's in your field, blah, blah, blah. You say yes, because you need to do it a certain amount of, a, cer a certain amount. It's like volunteering for your science. A lot of people, they're struggling to get their labs funded. They're trying to get their own papers published. They don't have time for this. They're not getting paid. Meanwhile, or the are big, they? A lot of well, maybe these guest editors so, are so because the, the, <laughs> so here's the thing. Usually they're not. Sure, so it's a hundred million hours a year is the estimate of time that's being spent by free reviews. Now, mm. for a lot of these mega journals, because there's so much pressure. 
And yet thousands and thousands of more papers being published. And, and this is another that? there's another issue with it in the turnaround times, which is a normal journal has about 200 days or so between submitting and publication. Uh, some of these journals are promising times, turnaround times of 31 days, right. as low as 31 days, 40 days, 50 days. There are incentives for reviewers who may not be reviewing something in their field because they're guest editors to get a discount on their own publishing mm. from these publishing houses if they can turn them in quickly. So they're not paid. It's not here's per, per money. Yeah. It's here's in a time. discount yeah. that's not yeah. money. So that's not a bribe. That's just a discount for good job at being fast at a thing that normally takes a lot of time and thought. So there's all these issues that could be out there. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things though is now we've got the AI that's coming along that's going to also further stress test. So we may we may have seen the death of these open access journals to some extent because if suddenly if suddenly these these journals that are pumping out tens of thousands of uh, of of papers don't have impact factor if it can't help your career to do what I'm going to call self publishing of your study at right. this point based on what I've seen from the how the numbers <laughs> the costs and the 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 review and then the the fallout from all these unreviewed or fraudulent studies self-publishing your study is going to do as much for you as self-publishing your book and handing it out to your friends just go down to kinko's print it hand it out to your people around uh, your institution or wherever you are Woo, we wrote a paper great or share it with one of these institutions if you want to pay twenty five hundred dollars for them to do it or why ever do but that? But no why not? gravitas. Yeah. yeah. Because because the unanswered question, that the thing that's really like, they're talking like, oh, the integrity of the publishing is extremely important. Who are these thousands of people paying thousands of dollars per study yeah. to have a study, a fraudulent study with fake citations, the paper puppy mills out there who does this benefit? Because that's the list I want. I don't now. I don't even care about <laughs> any of the rest of this integrity yeah. issue. I want the names, and I want to. I want to do a whole show someday, just talking about the re researchers, like calling them up. <laughs> hey, you published a study under your name that was completely bogus. What do you do, Doctor? What? Oh, he's. <laughs> oh, okay. You're busy. I get it. Patient. Oh, it's surgery. Oh, okay. Well, good luck. Anyway, I, I, uh, I don't really care uh, about the business model aspect of it, but the integrity aspect of it has to be there. We have to be able to trust science. I, I think it may be. I, I think the problem is that it, it time has. Time for it to go. The, the problem is that so much of science has become a business model. Mm -hmm. And that where, you know, I don't know how you don't have it be driven by money in yeah, well, you know in any regard been. well yeah well in in the very olden days you had the gentleman scientist who was <laughs> funded by their rich parents or their rich friends from the gentleman's club and they got to go sail off to an island and come back and write a big thing about it or they got to just that do whatever like they did so much fun the little tower in the college the university of london and they're oh, okay. clean without without living. going without Ooh. going back that far yeah. we, no, we it, covered it's early on in the show we covered to one degree yeah. or another <laughs> early on the show and i now i i'm gonna leave it out because i don't remember i think it was lancet but again i could be wrong what uh the who are the australian publisher uh is that lancet anyway there were one of these publications, a lot of paid industry advertising papers were making their way in around yeah. the process. And then they would be hired. You could hire a, a company owned by the publishing company separate from the paper to consult 
with getting your paper through, which was basically a pay to publish method in the old system. So that, yeah. so having uh, levels of corrupt activity by both publishers who are greedy and by people who may want to put out papers for their own career interest. Career. This yeah. has been going on. <laughs> but this is the, this is also what we talked about. AI finding fraudsters. <laughs> Excuse me. Allowing for them, but also catching them is going to be a really interesting go- thing going forward because it can also be applied backwards in time. So if you have published a fake study out AI there, I'm looking at you people yeah. out there. Oh, oh. AI is going to find you out. And we're oh, going to do a whole yeah. show where we put your face on the screen and talk yeah. about how you published a fake study. AI is watching you. That's right. Oh, oh, what's real and what is not anymore? I have some things to bring up for the last little bit of the show here. Um, We talked previously about the possibility, according to a study from this past year, about the Epstein-Barr virus being responsible for uh, onset of multiple sclerosis in people with a predisposition for multiple sclerosis. Another paper has just come out related to a different, uh, a different organism, Clostridium perfringens, that produces a toxin called Epsilon. And their work, not in humans, but in mice, suggests that this uh, Epsilon toxin could potentially uh, be something that opens up capillaries and blood vessels and allow or or the and allows uh, the toxin to get into the brain to initiate autoimmune uh, activities that end up leading to the myelin degradation that leads to what is called multiple sclerosis. And so they had healthy mice and mice that they uh, gave these bacteria to and those healthy mice were able to they had really nice healthy capillaries the bacteria nothing happened to them but when they gave them uh or when they gave mice that had a a genetic predisposition to an multiple sclerosis type disease that is dis, uh, autoimmune disorder that degrades mul- uh, the myelin and they gave them the uh, the bacteria it within the intestine broke down the boundaries the toxin was able to get into the blood cells and was able to get to the brain and compromise the immune system wow. yeah so once again this is showing a link between gut and brain health gut mm-hmm. and immune system gut and the nervous system um and the and and that that fragile interplay the interface between our genetic predisposition and the organisms that we come into contact with the ones that end up in our guts the ones that can lead to particular disorders in some individuals and none at all in others so whereas you know healthy people who don't have genetic predisposition to multiple sclerosis could come in contact with uh, this bacteria and have absolutely nothing happen there is the possibility or an increased probability, right, that this particular interaction, now that we've seen in mice, could be leading to something similar in people. And so, of course, this is uh, something that needs to be investigated a bit further, but it it gives us a little, you know, one other possib- possibility for a target to look at for some, for maybe a subpopulation of individuals who uh, who have multiple sclerosis. So if it's being caused essentially by a bacteria in the gut, yeah. if you took an antibiotic, is it too late if you already have multiple scler- sclerosis or could the myelin sheath rebuild if you clear out the toxin? Right. And so this is, this is the question. And the researchers were uh were questioning whether this uh this treatment 
could neuralize the talk if, if you treated it somehow targeted the epsilon toxin whether it could halt new disease activity or uh, because very often there's this um, relapsing or remitting aspect of multiple sclerosis where the disease will halt halt or it seems to halt for a period of time and then suddenly symptoms get worse again um, and so if there's you know, some aspect to gut changes, bacterial, uh, bacterial influences. There are lots of anecdotal tales of changing your diet, influencing how your multiple sclerosis plays mm -hmm. out. Um, you know, and I say anecdotal because there's still, you know, very, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to say, you know, you bring down inflammation and maybe that can help to a certain degree, but it's an mm -hmm. autoimmune disease. So once your immune system has already become sensitized you know how do you how do you really bring it back mm -hmm. and and stop the autoimmunity mm -hmm. right altogether yeah huh yeah so perhaps an antibiotic perhaps something that targets the epsilon toxin itself perhaps you know depending on if you catch it early versus right. late after right you know, so this is you right. have to do you have to do um a check of your microbiome regularly if you have a genetic predisposition and say like, right. oh man, this one bacteria, the levels are increasing. We need to put you on antibiotics right now and you could prevent it yeah. from showing up. Yeah. yeah. I'm, starting to, I'm starting to agree with you more and more, Blair, that the uh, microbiome checkup should be a mandatory, like, forget the Every whole thing. Every year, where... right? Annual poop test, please. <laughs> For... Forget the thing where they 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 make you turn your head and cough and all that. That that's you know how many that's hernias one thing. do we really need to? We could, yeah. that time could that's be. That's funny. Spent. I've never been asked to do that. Oh <laughs> 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 well, no! Well, gosh, uh, my doctor always does that one. Oh, okay. I guess. Uh, Right. That's different. Depends on the doctor you go yeah, to. That yeah, must be yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, very yeah. cool. Yeah, so possibly, you know, this is another another pathway to the pathogenesis of this autoimmune disorder oh. and to leading to uh, treatment to halt that pathogenesis, which would be pretty awesome. Now, as <laughs> I... Well, well, you oh, I was going to say, that the other thing is, uh, whenever we're talking about a genetic predisposition... Yeah. Uh, and we found something that can uh, take advantage of whatever the d DNA uh, defense or repair me mechanism, whatever is there that's that's at the intersection mechanistically causing it. This might not be the only thing that triggers it, too. Right. So it also gives a, a, an interesting place for researchers to look for other gut microbes that could access these same pathways and uh, build a profile of the dangers of the thing, the microbiological dangers to people with their predispositions. So it's a very fascinating story. Yeah. Um, and in other fascinating, thought-provoking stories, researchers who just published in an open access nature communications journal, uh, they're... Yeah, it's a Nothing good one. Wrong there, with open access. There's nothing at all. Researchers, um, they've been wanting, looking into the question of what is it in our brains that distinguishes what is real from what is imagined? What happens in our Skeptical brains? Skeptical fish. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. We, mm -hmm. This exactly in our brains. It's not a hamster running in a wheel. It is really a, a group, a school of skeptical fish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Anyway, the uh, the researchers uh, uh, looked into what they call one trial per participant psychophysics. So looking at uh, reactions within the brain with computational modeling, neuroimaging, to show how brains respond to what is real and what is imagined, what's there and what is not there. And they, they really f showed that in the brain, judgments of reality um, are intermixed. And there's this balance where the brain at one point 
goes, no, 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 this is totally imagined. This is all me. I know this is all me. And if you slide the lever a little bit to the other end of the spectrum, the brain goes, oh, I know this is all coming from outside me. I totally know this. But there's some place, and maybe that's where the uncanny valley lies. Somewhere in the middle, there's a place where the brain goes, well, it could be one or the other. And it's a very intermixed signal. Yeah. And so you see a combination in the brain of uh, the imagined and the, re of the, and the real. So um, in this experiment, the researchers were looking at the accounts of basically our brains monitoring of reality. And they had a number of trials, one trial per participant. So they had a number of different situations where they had people looking at a fixation point and then they had uh, something, a, a, a noise image. And then they asked people to imagine things um, and to basically tell them how vivid their imagery was, what was there, what was not. Um, and they had a combination trial where there actually was signal in the noise. So there was real stuff in there for the brain to pick up on that wasn't specific. It wasn't just noise. Um, and the, the researchers found that there was this definite combination of what people saw they imagined and what they what they thought they saw versus what was actually there what they could imagine was there um and then when they as they moved forward they looked at areas of the brain that were uh being involved in the vividness and the imagination versus actual perception and they found that there were a number of different areas that were involved in kind of the the different stuff and where there are some visual cortex areas that are always involved in both because your mental imagery can also be you know is visual in nature very often um there were there were parts that were more or less activated. So for instance, the interior insula was active on both sides of the brain and much more active in uh, truly perceived situations than in where there was greater imagery or imagination, but there was overlap as well. So anyway, yeah. So there's a little bit of overlap. It says so far the brain can tell the difference between reality and imagination, right? So the brain does know this. Um, but what this implies is that there is going to be a point at which we are able to actively either, we are going to be able to actively manipulate the brain to cross the threshold so that reality is uh, not perceived. From but no, thank you. Yeah, well, you can't wait, tell no, the difference. Mean, but we, don't we do this all the time? Isn't this like the whole? Isn't this what movies are? Yeah, and we. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to an extent, we when we jump during a movie, suspension, it's, suspension of disbelief, right? We, yeah, or like reading a book. Also, like yeah. reading a really yeah. thrilling book. Yeah. But as you're yeah. doing it, you know your brain knows it's imagined. Your brain knows you're, you're, you know, it might be a real book that or a movie that you're watching, but it knows that it's not a truly real. So you know you're watching a movie. Right. But right? if you but read a Stephen King overlap. novel and then you go to bed and you hear a weird sound down the hall, <laughs> then your imagination is telling you something from something you read is real. Does it does it yeah. count that sometimes uh, I can't tell if the refrigerator is making a weird noise or if my tinnitus is acting up? Is that <laughs> is that the middle? It's like is right that there? No. You're, there you're going to like, threshold. Real. There. Is this is this one? Noise. But once from yeah. inside the inside the house, isn't it? But it's real. It's still oh, a real okay. sound. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I don't have any unreal. What if they are unreal? What if I don't have tinnitus? What if I've imagined it? <laughs> but there are. So there are hallucinations. Um, uh, the uh, 
disorders of reality monitoring, yeah. like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, you have sent. You have the sensory aspects of the the brain not being able to tell the difference of whether it was externally or internally triggered. And that's, you know, that's the difference. Um, there's an effect, actually, this paper talks a bit about an effect that was discovered in 1910 by a female researcher, Mary Chavez West Perky, and this is called the Perky effect, um, which she discovered there's a, a mechanism that might underlie perceptual reality monitoring in healthy observers the participants were instructed to imagine various objects at a certain location in a white wall. While the participants didn't realize it, images of the same objects were simultaneously projected to the same location. All participants failed to notice the presence of the real stimuli, reflecting that, quote, if I hadn't known I was imagining, I would have thought it real. Okay. <laughs> I, I need that study to be done this 110 years later. Yeah. <laughs> to see if people are like surprised. Like, I can get in 1910, you might have not seen a projection before. Yes. Didn't yeah. my, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, so, voluntary this, control, something outside of voluntary something control. Something needs to be updated on that study to see yeah. if it still applies so, to anybody on the planet. But, yeah, so yeah, does, question the, if it even does the perky effect is, is the, <laughs> be the skeptical, skeptical fish, fish about fish, right. the perky effect. <laughs> My skeptical fish don't like it. Gosh, now I have this imaginary uh, fishbowl in my head. Where I got these little skeptical fish swimming around. I got to pay attention to my, my imaginary <laughs> fish. Or are they real? Now I don't know. Dude, will you ever really know if the skeptical fish are real? Are they, is what you're seeing real? Is it what's happening here? Do you, how can you even know? Anyway, they discovered their findings are inconsistent with the Perky effect. People tend to discard information, sensory information when they are... Uh, uh, when they're imagining and they challenge a proposal that the intention of volition associated with imagery is used to classify an experience as imagined rather than real. So there's definitely an interaction between source mis mixing internal versus external. But um, this leads to, like I said, the potential for investigating more disorders around sensory perception and also investigating more as we evolve technologically in the virtual realm of how the brain is able to tell the difference between internal versus external and what is real and what is inside me and imagined. It would be a very interesting study uh, to, have, to be looking at the brains of schizophrenics having uh, hallucinatory, audio hallucinatory episodes uh, where they can, in these episodes, they can be aware that the thing isn't real, but still viscerally be experiencing it yeah. simultaneously. So, yeah. And then, if there's a way then to, to narrow to that, switch that it, narrow overlap, it. to, yeah, that would be uh, extremely helpful to. A, uh, a subset of people who are suffering from those, that sort of a disease. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, the brain. It does create our reality. We, we, it really does. In, in conjunction with our bodies and our environments, our brain is that filter through which all we see is created. I think we did it. I think we've come to the end of the show, and I hope your brain is creating just a fabulous world for you right now. Yeah. A fabulous reality. Did we make it? Did we come to the end of the show? After We're here. We're there. Well, maybe 120 minutes, but anyway. <laughs> maybe, 100, maybe. We have come to the end and i do want to say thank you to everyone who's in our chat rooms thank you so much for chatting with us throughout this whole time 
in our Discord. Thank you for those of you who are there in our Discord. Fada, thank you so much for your help with show notes and with social media. Gord, Arn Lore, others who help with our happy chat rooms. Thank you for keeping the places safe and happy for all participants. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you so much for editing the show. I would also like to thank our Patreon sponsors because, you know, without our Patreon sponsors, we're nothing. So thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Ken Northcote, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, uh, Carol Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Ridden, Noodles Jack, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Steve Le Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rapin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Jimmy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Brids, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Roddy Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Phil, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie Paul, Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Parcararo, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you listening to this podcast or watching this stream right now would like to support us on Patreon, please head to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back 8 p.m. Pacific time broadcasting live from our Facebook and YouTube channels as well as twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you stare at some magic eyes and wonder if they're magic eye posters at all or just a staticky TV. Maybe it's all in your brain. Search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And if you're into newsletters, they might be one eventually <laughs> you can contact us directly as well email kiki at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com justin at twistminion at gmail.com or me blair at blairbaz at twist.org just be sure to put twist t w i s into the subject line or your email will be sent in a rover to a tidally locked exoplanet circling a red dwarf star <laughs> And we won't see it. Maybe our great, 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 great grandchildren will, but we won't. So, but they will hear everything we had to say about the world on Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Hey, if you learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week science is coming your way so everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand.
It's the after show. This show was so long. I think we already did an after show. Blair, how's it going? I over agree. There? <laughs> you still dancing? <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> I'm imagining I'm in bed right now. <gasps> no, I'm imagining you stomping your foot when you say no. I'm not. Oh. Yeah, I need yeah, to bed. Yeah, yeah. Well, Justin will be back in a moment. He probably went to get himself another cup of coffee. Yeah, he's like six deep, I think, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you obviously, Justin, he's, he's listening to us in his headphones right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure because his earbuds, mm -hmm. he said his earbuds are on. He's listening the whole time. Mm -hmm. You, Justin, don't have any appointments immediately after the show. <laughs> Apparently. Maybe no. Felix is still sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, this is, I have a tremendously busy day ahead. As as always, uh, but yeah, Blair, you do look tired. Maybe you should just say good night. Good night. <laughs> That's all we get. That's it. That's all. Uh. I do want. I do want to. Now I have like this whole desire to create like uh, uh, a website called like the the bad report. Or the <laughs> the bad impact, and just list uh, researchers who attach themselves to fraudulent uh, papers, like a negative yeah. impact uh, website for just sh public awesome. shaming purposes. Well, there for is um, shaming. there was a blog that I think got picked up by a larger group but the retraction watch it's like they uh it's not the bad report which is just so, yeah. so retraction watch uh which is run by ivan aransky has been around for a very long time very reputable um and they basically keep tabs on papers that are being retracted studies that and, and, somebody put in a thing and maybe it will get retracted and ooh, this one actually yeah. did get retracted and this is what happened you know so they it's a journalistic slant on stuff but they don't they don't catch everybody because of course they can't but they've been very influential in okay. i think tr tracking and making public a lot of the uh, the misbehavior that's happened in the research institution of you know over the years yeah. I need to. I, you got to send me a link to that because I got to go check it out. Because now I'm, I'm, oh, I'm retraction watch. Wait, I, I didn't realize. Like, do okay, you have... so I, so uh, I go through what I would consider pretty credible sources. I go through uh, usually when preparing for the show. I, I'm selecting from yeah. journals that have the highest impact ratings. That's not the thing I'm looking at. But something like any stories that come out of nature or, you know, this sort of thing tend to tend to be have a credibility to them that is yeah. obvious in the paper when you read it. You know, it's not like like I've read I've seen papers that I've I'm like. There was there was one and I don't want to pick on anybody. But they were this the the research article was mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, you know, uh, oh, it's a highly debated issue, and then cited a hundred and twenty-five year old paper. Yeah, <laughs> like how is that a hotly debated? Something's already. <laughs> and then as I proceeded to read, I was like, oh gosh, this is this is terrible. And and so this sort of thing happens where you know I'm, I'm you you come across a study that sounds like it's interesting based on the title, and you go in to start reading it and. I, this, what is this? What even yeah. is this thing? Yeah, there's What's another. It? Yeah, there's so there's also there's re, there's retraction watch where it's like a journalistic slant on it, telling the stories, and then there's uh, the retraction watch database, and so you can actually search it to search researchers and search for different retractions, and it's uh, so they've got lots of things for you. Okay, so and in retractions, though, like, 
maybe I'm maybe I'm just a naive country science communicator and don't know all the intricacies of this big old science world, but it seems to me like there could be a good reason for retractions. Like, ah, we did this study and we were very confident in how we put it together and everything. And then we found out through a later genomic analysis that we had actually been looking at the wrong microbacteria that had been misidentified yeah. before the study. So there could be like, yeah. I get it, there can be a whole list of reasons why a good study could require retraction. Yes. But Many the reasons, fact that, but sometimes the fact that not. Wiley, poor Wiley Publishing lifted up the hood on this $300 million publishing vehicle that they had purchased and went, oh gosh, it's squirrels on treadmills all over the place here. Rats have been chewing at the wires and publishing with fake citations. Like that must have been horrifying for them. Uh, they had to stop the publication of some of the specialty papers for like yeah. a couple of weeks and it said they said it cost them like nine million dollars yeah. and and they're probably not done and and now now they're they're like a giant portion of that vehicle that they purchased has been <laughs> somebody on impact somebody purchased a scientific lemon that's what so, they somebody's somebody got paid 300 million dollars and is going we did it and guess what? My guess is they're probably trying to do it again. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if you were that successful at a thing. Fraudsterly. Mm. Crime. Like criminals who are successful at crime tend to repeat, I would guess. I don't know. It sounds like yeah. it's a big problem. I'm glad that the Web of Science, which, by the way, I, I actually didn't know ISI Web of Science Web of existed. Science. Yes, yes. It's a wonderful database also, didn't not just understand. for impact factor, but also for searching for studies. Yes. I was another way. Now, now I have I a whole other thing science. I can check out. Yeah, there's good good databases out there. Oh, Blair is like now, like slowly fa falling, <laughs> sliding down her chair, slumping, <laughs> slumping, slumping, laughing off into um, oblivion. Yeah, before we uh, disappear into our own separate oblivions, I would like to wish Sunny Knox. Happy 18th birth anniversary and an anniversary and a twist anniversary. What are we at twist anniversary? Sunny Knox says, Hey, I've been listening to twist for 18 years as of this year. Wow. Thanks for being with us that long. Really appreciate yeah. that you're here to tell us that right now. Have we, really we, but awesome. this show hasn't been on the air that long. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh wait a sec what year I'm, is it i'm uh, yeah i'm still it's, all, it's been on that long today <laughs> <laughs> oh, Blair. i'm so sorry it's all my fault i got that the way i got uh carried how many away cups of coffee this, this is several yeah yeah yes it's not getting carried away it's getting excited i have to start my topic. day you're starting your and day. And I got an extra hour of sleep because now finally the difference in the daylight savings oh. times is over. So, so I'm all fresh. Super, super energetic. I got that hour of sleep that apparently I needed yeah. badly. That one hour made all of the difference. And then there's six cups of coffee. And then, the, uh. and then it's always energizing to hang out with the two of you and our wonderful audience. So. Oh, it really is. Yeah, yeah. but... Here on this particular coast, it is getting later, and some of us do need as much rest as we can get these days. I'm going to go through these attraction databases and do some public shaming. Okay. <laughs> you go do that. <laughs> you, you go get into public shaming. <laughs> I feel like that's a good career choice for me. Uh... <laughs> oh, Sunny Knox, at least I don't have to get up as early as we used to have to get up to make it to the radio station to actually do the show yeah. in the morning yeah. although i don't know this is like justin's doing that now yeah it's fun. it's it's great i feel to... like i'm on the i'm on the late night end of it now with blair i've got i've gone to extremes why can't we do this show at like noon because i have a job 
Right. Oh, why do we have to have jobs? Why? Yeah. How come? Jerks. You know what we should? What we should do is start charging for papers to be covered on the show. There you go. And then we have a business model. But then we're going to have to do more than, you know, a dozen shows a week. We're going to have to, like, really raise the bar. Oh, if we could charge it. Like, how much do you think we could charge to cover somebody's story? Don't you think people would question, our, uh, question our credibility? If no, we, we were... wouldn't mention that we're charging it. We'd keep you it a secret did. or kind of keep it. Ah, oh, I ruined everything. Oh, that was another ruined good everything. idea thrown yes, away. Dude. Dang it. <sighs> Gersh Jurnit. Ah. Say the say the things in the right way so that Identity 4 doesn't have to yell at us that it doesn't work that way. It, say good morning, say Justin. Good morning, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are looking forward to seeing everyone healthy, happy, and well-rested in their own wonderful realities next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And so whatever, yeah, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious. Look both ways. Avoid the uncanny valley. Uh, look both ways because maybe you're in England, maybe you're in the US. You don't know. Good night. <laughs>